Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar. Um, my name is Sakshi Sethi. I manage OIDA membership here at OSA. I'm really excited to introduce today's presentation. It's sponsored by one of our corporate members, Menlo Systems. But before we get started, I just want to take a minute to review a couple of housekeeping items. So if you need any assistance on today's webinar, um, there is a chat icon at the bottom of your screen. Just click that and you can send me any of your technical issues or questions that you may have. We also, during this webinar, really encourage you to ask our speaker questions. Um, we have Nicola, who will be giving a robust presentation, and a couple of his colleagues have joined as well, who will be monitoring the Q&A box throughout the session. So if you have questions that come up about a specific slide um, or a specific topic, feel free to type those in when they come to you, and we will have people answering questions throughout the webinar. We will also take a brief moment at the end of the presentation to do some Q&A as well. Um, as a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. We will not be sharing a copy of the slides, but because the entire video is recorded, it will be posted online afterwards for free for everyone. Um, so in case you have to dip out early or you wanna share it with a colleague, you're more than welcome to do so. And I will actually drop the link to the webpage where you will find that um, just here shortly in the chat box. So that's everything that I have for housekeeping notes. I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over to our moderator, um, Patricia, and she's with Menlo Systems and she will get us started. Thank you. So hello, everybody. Thank you, Sakshi, for introducing us and to Osa for hosting us. And welcome to our attendees for the first part of our webinar mini-series on high-precision metrology. Our main speaker for today is Dr. Nikola Butsalovic, who is product manager for ultra-stable lasers here at Mandel Systems. Um, the uh, the, uh, the um, help with the Q&A session will be coming from Dr. Doug Schmidt, who is uh, product manager optical frequency combs, and Dr. Maurice Lessing, who is group leader for ultra-stable lasers. I would like um, to say a couple of words in the beginning about our company. Um, Mendel Systems was founded nearly 20 years ago in 2001 as a spin-off company from the Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optics in Garching, which is lying in the north of Munich. We are developing and manufacturing lasers and laser stabilization for high precision metrology applications. Our company is known for the Nobel Prize winning technology of the optical frequency comb. Professor Hench has received the Nobel Prize in 2005 for this invention. Menlo is based near Munich in Southern Germany and we have offices in the US and in China. We serve customers worldwide with applications in both in science and industry. Our main product line are optical frequency combs, which are unique in terms of stability, accuracy, and reliability. We also provide frequency stabilized lasers with subhertz line width output at nearly any wavelength. We combine these lasers with our combs to build complete systems for quantum technology. Our further product lines are solutions for terahertz time domain spectroscopy, as well as systems for timing distribution in large facilities. We also offer femtosecond fiber lasers as standalone devices. We use our patented figure nine technology for mode locking to ensure highest stability and low noise performance of the lasers. So after these uh, couple of introducing words, I would like to hand over to our main speaker, to Nicola, and we would like to encourage you to submit questions during the webinar and of course, to take part in the poll during the short break later on. Nicola, the stage is yours. Well, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Nikola Butalovic and I am a product manager for ultra-stable laser systems here at Menlo Systems. And the title of my today's talk is a practical guide to frequency metrology and uh, laser stabilizations. I would like to thank uh, Patricia for, for a nice introduction and also for 
Sakshi for the organization of everything and uh, who made this process run smoothly. So let's see how we go until the end. So um, Nikola Tesla, um, the man who invented the 20th century and who is these days uh, gaining his well-deserved recognition has pointed out as uh, frequency metrology as the main tool for, for progress in science and, and research and uh, being uh, ahead of his time in, in the stuff that he did, it turned out that he was uh, really right about this because what happened actually these days with the contemporary stuff that is circulating around the research community, we have some wonderful results like detection of gravitational wave or imaging of a black hole, which, uh, which are basically relying on the, on the support of a time and frequency uh, metrology techniques um, in order to, to get uh, the results of, of this unprecedented uh, level. So um, I would like to, to guide you through the through a little bit of history and uh, and uh, the language and the uh, techniques of how how these things are are possible these days so the the the, the skeleton of my talk is like we will first uh, speak about uh, uh, the motivation for for time metrology then we will speak about the, the uh, characterization of the oscillators in the time and frequency domain. And then um, we will conclude our uh, first part of the webinar with a small uh, polling question. And then in the second half, we will speak about um, basically what is our main driving force, the, the building of the optical clock and the measurement of optical frequencies. And then more specifically about the pound rubber hole uh, technique for laser stabilization and at the, the end a little bit uh, more uh, hardcore results from the from the research uh, in in the past um, decades so um, um, first we need to define the language of uh, time and frequency metrology because uh, it is usual stuff that that every every domain of human activity develops certain kind of slang that can be uh, a, a barrier for people to really enjoy the certain field and to understand it. So it's important that we define the language in first part, and then uh, I hope that everybody would be able to follow and understand what we are talking about. When we say a clock, we mean um, about a repetitive phenomenon that can be counted. So in the most obvious um, representation, it's a pendulum swing and the rotating dial, which is your grandfather's clock on the, on the wall. In a little bit more modern, you have a, a quartz oscillator and the readout of the quartz oscillator, which is completely fine. This stuff run free running. They are not references, but they are good enough for you to, to have your timekeeping during the day. Now, if you, want to do something a little bit more uh, serious, you have the same thing, repetitive phenomena and accounting device, but you reference uh, uh, a device to, to some atoms maybe. And uh, this is the state of the affairs uh, in the National Metrology Institute, how it is done. And then you end up with an um, international time scale. But uh, this, this slide shows you, uh, shows you um, really high-end stuff. And um, uh, until the end of, of this seminar, we are going to touch uh, and explain all of the, all of the uh, things present in this slide. We will explain what is a frequency comp, what is a laser uh, that is used as a, as a local oscillator for an optical clock, what is a, how do you characterize it, and, et cetera. So the first definition in our language base is a fractional frequency. Uh, so we go from simple towards the more complicated. And we need to know this term because we would like to compare different oscillators or different clocks without taking care about the, about the nominal frequency of operation. So um, 
uh, we here see the the progress of the of the development of the in, in clock performance and you know in the in the 18th century the somehow the globalization started and uh, uh, the fleet of the merchant ships were having problems to to determine their position in the in the ocean so uh, for the for the longitude problem there was a word and the 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 competition to develop ever ever better performing clocks has started. So the, the Harrison maritime uh, chronometer was the the beginning of the of the development of the precision time metrology. And today, when you have the completely connected and the global world, and basically what we are doing right now, uh, we have attendees from all over the world. Um, it is uh, the the more the uh, world has become connected and globalized. The, the more precision we, we needed in the, in the uh, time metrology and we end up with the, with the performance of clocks that, that have a stability uh, on a, such a high level that they lose second, one second in, in millions of, of years. So um, uh, we need to know the, the right scientific terms, how to characterize the performance of our clocks. So first, uh, um, again, we have to define what we mean by precision, accuracy, and stability. The, these things uh, have to be repeated uh, uh, constantly because even, even us who are dealing with them uh, sometimes get confused what we, when we speak about them. So uh, when, you, when you say precision, you should uh, think about... Uh, uh, some measurement and how the, the results of that measurements are dispersed, spread around certain mean value. The accuracy uh, concerns the, the definition. For example, uh, the internationally defined uh, second is, is defined in a well-known well way. And uh, you want to see how close your clock performs uh, to the definition of, of the second. And, uh, Stability is our main concern in our business, is the performance of some device because we, we, we construct devices and we, we follow the performance and the, and the evolution of the output of certain device uh, in the time domain. So we would like to, to construct an oscillator that is, that is stable and gives a stable signal in, in, as, as the time progresses. So um, uh, when you construct a, an oscillator, a clock or something, it is uh, of course um, not possible to decouple it completely from the, from the environment. And uh, this somehow has uh, even a philosophical repercussions because it shows that uh, it is not possible to isolate anything uh, ideally, so we are all connected and everything in, in, in nature is uh, connected somehow. But when, when you do a nice piece of engineering and you reduce the, the effects of the environment to, to the performance of your clock or, or the oscillator, uh, you end up like something in the, in the right part of this slide with some systematic uh, residual uh, a residual evolution of the frequency of the of the oscillator and with some random instability uh, short term instability that is completely random that you can not control actively a part of um, making decisions in the in the design of of your device so basically this is the the residual effect the residual physics of the of, of the stuff that you use as an oscillator. So we first need to see how to, how to characterize the performance of this in, in, in long term and in time domain of this fractional frequency stability. This tells us how good our clock is. So um, uh, let me just, uh, yeah. So uh, here we see uh, a readout uh, of, the, of the frequency counter because uh, if you want to, to follow the performance of, of the output of your, of your oscillator, you, you measure its frequency and you see a certain, certain trace 
uh, of, of frequency data. Uh, uh, the problem with uh, this kind of data set is that it does not have um, a well-defined uh, average value. So the mean of this data set is time dependent because it is normal that in the clocks, you have a drift of certain, certain kinds, more uh, slow, uh, lower or higher, depending on the construction. So um, it is not possible to use the standard statistic and the standard deviation, so therefore, the, the trick is to, to quantify the performance in order to, uh, by comparing the, the neighboring samples of, of, uh, of frequency measurement. So uh, by comparing the changes between, uh, between uh, uh, sampling periods of your frequency, you, you can deduce the, the variance, how much your frequency changes from one sample to another. And this is what is called Allen variance. And uh, uh, Allen variance is a thing that, that is uh, called a two sample variance because it, as I said, compares two uh, co uh, contiguous samples. But these samples um, can be uh, of, of, of different, uh, uh, different lengths. So by post processing your data artificially, you, you introduce uh, different different averaging times and this is the output of uh, of the computation this is something that we uh, usually use to characterize the performance of our oscillator uh, in time domain in this uh, particular case uh, somehow during the uh, in the community um, uh, it is important to know the, the performance of your clock at, for example, one second. And uh, usually for us, because we make uh, high-end uh, uh, oscillators, our performances are at the level of 10 to the minus 15 change at one second. So this means that the oscillators we produce are changing the frequency at the, at the 15th decimal place of uh, after the uh, of, of um, fractional frequency. So um, at the end of the, of the webinar, we will share a link with you uh, that uh, among other things, some supplemental material that somehow did not fit in the flow of this talk, uh, but are important. Uh, we will also give you uh, one data set of uh, one frequency trace that you can use to practice your um, uh, oscillator analysis skills by using, for example, Stable32. Uh, you can download it. It, is, it has become an open source. And uh, you can try to and see what, what you get. Um, in order to, to play around a little bit, uh, uh, there is a nice link with an ex-colleague of mine, uh, Gianni Di Domenico. Uh, he has made a simulation uh, of behavior of Allen deviation with some uh, deterministic perturbances. So I invite you to, after uh, th these links that, uh, that we have in, um, in, the, um, in the webinar uh, will be also sent to you at the end. So you can go to this address and uh, uh, play a little bit around with the effect of the white noise, for example, how it uh, uh, how it affects the, the Allen deviation and Allen variance. And uh, also you can see what happens, what happens if you have some periodic perturbations, for example. Um, you can see the, the oscillation in the, in the Allen deviation. And also uh, what is, uh, what is uh, uh, always present in, in the, the things that we produce, and we will speak about that later. It's a, a drift, so certain drift uh, uh, in your frequency, as you have seen in this raw data set uh, a few slides ago. So this drift with a certain slope in frequency also reflects in the in the graph of the Allen deviation. So this is also the begin, of course, the beginning. Uh, but um, uh, now you you have some kind of uh, some kind of, of uh, information, what can you see from a basically uh, recognize in the Allen deviation plot. So drift, oscillations, and uh, the slope uh, decided by the white noise present in your device. So um, 
then uh, it is important also to characterize an oscillator output in the frequency domain. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, a point where, where you realize that you are living in the, in the, in the real world. So mathematical, um, mathematical representation of a pure sign signal is uh, quite elegant, idealistic. So uh, mathematis ma mathematicians and physicists, um, they simplify things and, uh, and engineers they um, they introduce complications because they deal with um, with the real world and the uh, time and frequency metrology is some kind of uh, nice blend between the the fundamental physics uh, atomic nice atomic physics and and really really uh, high end engineering so in the lower part you see the you see actually how the the real signal uh, looks like so uh, each real signal has some random fluctuations of the amplitude and the random fluctuations of the phase which we call the phase noise when you hook your signal source uh, to, to a spectrum analyzer you will not see a, a Dirac delta uh, function you will see a signal with with certain with certain widths and why the, the delta function um, gets some width is because of this of the presence of the phase noise at different frequencies. So each signal is a, a subject to different perturbations, some faster in, in this what we call high frequency, uh, high Fourier frequency domain, and some lower. And uh, uh, like uh, some few hundred hertz, which in this lower part of the of the uh, frequency range, you see you see effects of of mechanical uh, perturbations, vibrations, shocks, and stuff. While in the in the further far away uh, in in Fourier domain, you can see some effects of the electronics detection measurements and stuff. So basically, a textbook example of the of the phase noise comprises of these five uh, noise types but um, because I wanted to be practical and to to explain uh, uh, what what uh, you what you meet in the real life I, I I'm escaping to go in in uh, super details about this but I would like to to uh, point out that uh, everybody needs some tangible number to characterize the, the oscillator. And this is what you get from the integrated phase noise. So the phase noise is basically the real physics uh, of, of the oscillator output, the, the foundation of, of the information that you have about the, the performance of some oscillator. And when you integrate this phase noise, you can get the, the RMS, root mean square value, of, of the uh, of the deviation of the of the phase of the output of your oscillator one more interesting thing that uh, deserves attention is these kinds kind of units that are that are present uh, in in, uh, in in connection with these uh, with these quantities so these uh, power spectral densities are always expressed in the square RMS unit of, of the, of the uh, perturbation at certain Fourier frequency in one hertz bandwidth. So for example, um, if you have a frequency noise and not phase noise, you have a unit that is called a hertz square per, per hertz, which is the first shock uh, when you encounter the, the, uh, uh, some kind of uh, deeper analysis of the oscillator because uh, you don't understand what why it is hertz square per hertz but it is important to to say that uh, top uh, unit uh, is the the power uh, power kind of uh, representation of certain quantity that is analyzed and the lower unit is the bandwidth hertz so if you have hertz square this means how much hertz 
uh, RMS, your output oscillates at that, that Fourier frequency uh, in, in one hertz bandwidth. And that's the whole magic about this, but somehow uh, it takes time to understand the, 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 these kind of, of units. So um, when you when you have the, the oscillator output uh, and the phase noise is usually in engineering uh, uh, manuals and uh, uh, useful real world uh, uh, documentation represented as spectral purity. So you have a certain uh, ratio of the, of the noise component to the carrier and you know exactly how much, how many decibels relative to the carrier your noise is. Uh, in this graph, we can see, uh, uh, we, can, we can understand why the, the phase noise and the signal purity is important. Because if you think about the uh, frequency domain usability of the, of the clean, clean local oscillator, what does it mean? It usually means that there is some processing involved that the output of your local oscillator, you will use to mix with the signal that you want to analyze. And this exactly, uh, th this means that whatever leftover noise you have in, in your local oscillator, it will degrade the performance of your system. So if you have a certain uh, high level of a broadband, broadband phase noise, why? white uh, phase noise this will this will reduce the signal to noise ratio of of your analysis and if you have a wide noise uh, close to the carrier this will limit the resolution of your of your signal analysis and this becomes clear from from this uh, from from this uh, picture so um, this was the the importance of the, of the usage of the signal in, in frequency domain, but then the output of your uh, super nice oscillator uh, can be also used in time domain. So when you think about using a certain clean and stable signal in a time domain, it is usually about clocking something. So all of our devices have some system clock that uh, determines the cycle of the operation of, of some uh, computer system, for example, or you have, a, a, you have a digital channels of communications where it is also important to have a nice clocking of the data, or you want to, you want to synchronize different, different elements of certain system. And uh, in that sense, it is important to know the, the jittering of, of your signal being the pulses or, or the zero crossing of the sign output of your oscillator. This is characterized by the, by the timing jitter. And again, the timing jitter directly relates to the phase noise. So you see the importance of the phase noise in whole of the story. If you go uh, deeper in, in um, autodactic didactic approach, uh, if you follow the links and the references that we will share with you, you, you can, for example, see in Professor Rubiola's website, a nice, uh, nice uh, uh, assembly of, of graphs and relationship of different units that are uh, in circulation in the time and frequency uh, community. And you will basically see that the, the conversion between the units are possible, but I would like, I wanted to, to to stress out that uh, that the phase noise is the source of all of of, of these uh, units, and here you have a you have a power spectral density of of basically time noise and time fluctuation, and which is which is expressed in some seconds RMS seconds, or because uh, we are dealing with high end oscillators, uh, more in femtoseconds, because um, here we have an an example of, of the performance of uh, one of our timing, uh, timing distribution systems. And this is basically an optically, uh, optical si system of optical distribution of, of pulsed, uh, pulsed lasers based on, on uh, stabilized fibers. 
And at the output of, of these fibers, you can measure the performance of the system. So uh, these timing systems are used for high-end applications for timing of, for example, accelerators or for ge uh, geodetical observations. And so you can see more about uh, this product in, in the link uh, that, that we will share later. But uh, you see the, the performance of our system uh, are in, in some femtosecond RMS stability. So now we have been through Allen deviation, time domain characterization of the oscillators, uh, phase noise and timing jitter. Uh, and we would like to make uh, uh, just a short break for you to, uh, uh, to uh, take a look at our survey. survey. And uh, we would like to, we would be very thankful for your feedback. And of course, uh, please uh, keep questions coming. Uh, and uh, in a couple of minutes to three minutes, we will, we will uh, continue. So uh, we would like to ask you about uh, what is the expected level of the short-term stability that would be interesting for your application. And we would also like to know where, where would you benefit from the, from the lower level of phase noise close to the carrier or further from the carrier. So please uh, take a few seconds. And uh, if you are not sure, you have an option to say, I'm not sure. Okay. Okay, so uh, these are uh, very interesting results because basically uh, we are making uh, this uh, small webinar series in order to inform our uh, community and uh, if you are not sure, in a large percentage, this is an indication that we can communicate more and, uh, and exchange the ideas and, and form, uh, form somehow a community and discuss the, the details uh, and uh, uh, discover finally what, what you might need for your application together with us. Thank you very much for, for your feedback. Yeah. Okay, so um, basically, um, just a moment. We are um, uh, we are we were speaking about the the general language of uh, frequency metrology, uh, which can relate to quartz oscillators, uh, to to different kinds of oscillators. But our main business is uh, photonics, so. Um, we are we are very active in uh, in producing system systems that uh, support uh, the the construction of the optical clocks. So let us see why we are interested in um, in optical clocks and uh, how to measure the frequency of light. So uh, at the at the current moment, uh, the the definition of the Second relies on the on the cesium atom on a hyperfine transition in the cesium atom that is at the level of some gigahertz, uh, some two uh, nine point two gigahertz, and if you remember the slide from the beginning, uh, this kind of system uses some good quartz as a local oscillator. Now, with the first uh, part of this webinar, you. You should know what a good quartz means uh, when somebody tells you, aha, this is the oscillator with a fractional frequency stability of 10 to the minus 11 at one second. Now, I guess you are able to, to know what it means. Um, so 
everything about the, 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 the gigahertz uh, domain, so the microwave domain is very well developed, so motivated by the needs of the radar uh, and the general, general needs in, in engineering and scientific community. And microwave domain, very well established. Uh, you have an in infinite amount of suppliers to choose from, and uh, there are no mysteries in, in, uh, in measuring microwave frequencies. Uh, you can uh, you can construct pr primary frequency standards and the international time scale basically at the moment relies on a, on the ensemble of a primary cesium clocks dispersed all over the world and they contribute with a smaller or higher weight to the inter international time scales. Um, but uh, we would like to to go to to higher frequencies and why. Um, this is shown in this simple formula. So I'm avoiding to show a lot of formulas, but uh, from this one, it is clear uh, uh, what, uh, what is the gain of moving towards higher frequencies. If you go from gigahertz to terahertz and you end up with a, a line of, uh, of the, your reference that is one hertz, this means that you can, uh, you can go to a very high atomic quality factors and this atomic quality factor which is 10, 10 to the 10th or 10 to the 8th with cesium is 10 to the 14th and uh, potentially above with uh, with the atomic uh, with the optical uh, atomic transitions and this immediately means that you can have a fractional frequency stability of your frequency standard uh, four or five orders of magnitude higher if you switch to terahertz, uh, terahertz frequencies. Therefore, uh, at this moment, research efforts are, are focused on single ion clocks, which is really magnificent that you can, you can interrogate a single ion trapped in some kind of device. And uh, a different approach, which has a better signal signal to noise ratio is optical lattice neutral atom clocks. So you can see also the effect of the signal to noise contribution to the, to the fractional frequency stability. So, uh, but um, it's all fine, but uh, how to measure the, the, the optical frequencies? It's, it's super fast for the electronics. Terahertzes are not detectable with the, with the ordinary detectors. So, um, um, some of the applications, of course, yeah, I, I wanted to, to, to share um, interesting application of, of the terahertz uh, uh, and uh, 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 optical atomic clocks is that if you go to a certain, sur certain super high level of stability, you are able, you are able to, to see, for example, the effects of the theory of relativity at, at the much shorter time scale. And there was a very interesting experiment in, in Japan in the Sky Tree Tower, where two, uh, I think, strontium atomic clocks were put on 450 meters uh, height difference. And you could have seen live that these two identical clocks tick uh, with, uh, with frequencies that should be the same, but due to the the effects of the gravitational potential, they tick with the frequencies that are 21 hertz apart, but on a 400 something terahertz uh, carrier, which is which is a fantastic level of of a, a precision of uh, measurement that that you can have. So some hertzes in in the carrier of of some hundreds of terahertz, but how to measure the optical frequencies? Yes. So if you have a known signal, I hope that you will be able to hear this. Uh, I think that my laser pointer is, but yeah. So if you have a known signal, which is for example, 440 Hertz, you know nothing about that signal. You know nothing about the other signal that is close to it. If you hear it, the effect is quite the same. But if you listen to them both at the same time, you will hear a beat note that is at the difference of the frequencies of two signals. 
so I don't know if you are able to to hear the beat. Whoa, 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 whoa. So this is the beat note between two signals, out of which one is known and the second is unknown. The frequency of the unknown signal, you can simply then determine by adding or subtracting, depending on the situation, the, the frequency of the beat note uh, with, the, with the known signal. And so what do you make a beat with the, if you have a, a, a light to measure? So uh, brute force approach, a brute force approach to the solution of the problem is the, is the multiplication of the frequency of the cesium standard, but this is a really not practical. This kind of thing, the frequency chain is made to only measure one optical frequency, and it takes uh, two rooms in a, in a large building. So uh, basically, um, that's that's the when you when the science is stuck, when the when the when the ideas are are scarce, uh, you you do what you can until the moment somebody sits down and understands the behavior uh, of, of certain certain thing, which in our case was the behavior of the uh, femtosecond laser. So femtosecond laser is a special type of pulsed laser that by employing certain techniques makes all, a lot of uh, modes of the laser oscillate in phase and uh, if you increase the number of the of, of modes and uh, if you have a laser gain material that is that has a wide enough gain you can reach very short laser pulses into few uh, to few hundred of femtoseconds uh, i think from 60s this was this was known uh, mode locking of the laser was known but the the behavior of the of the field and the, what what goes on inside it took some time to understand and that's where uh, professor hensch's group activity comes in basically uh, in the in uh, in order to um, to use the the femtosecond laser to measure optical frequencies you need to, to stabilize two frequencies that are characterizing the, every femtosecond laser. So when you stabilize femtosecond laser, you get what is called the frequency comb. And two frequencies that you need to stabilize is the repetition rate of the laser, which is quite straightforward. You just shine the light to a photodetector, apply the feedback, and through a piezo, through the length of the laser cavity, you can very easily stabilize the repetition rate of the laser. But there is also the offset between the, the underlying laser field and the, the envelope of the pulse. And in order to detect this offset, you need to, to have a wide enough uh, spectrum, make a beat, as we said, but in this case, a beat between tens of thousands of lines. And as the output of this uh, 1F to 2F scheme, you get directly the, out, uh, the frequency of the, of the uh, offset, uh, carrier envelope offset frequency. And then you can stabilize both frequencies. And what you end up is basically a ruler of, uh, of light, uh, a ruler uh, made out of tens of thousands of well-defined optical lines with which now you can make a beat, as we said in this audio slide, of the unknown laser frequency. And by measuring this beat frequency, you basically down convert all of your measurements to the, to the microwave domain where it is possible and, uh, and very easy to measure frequencies. And um, uh, yes, you can take a look at one of our videos. The link to, to, to video to our, on our YouTube channel will be shared with you later. So basically, you shine unknown light. You, you down convert it to the microwave because the repetition rates 
So the distance between two modes of the frequency comps are usually some hundred megahertz to gigahertz, which means microwave frequency. You, you make the bit, you count the bit frequency, and you have all of the information that you need about the behavior of, of your laser. And what, what is revolutionary and why the Nobel Prize was awarded for this, instead of making a frequency chain that occupies a whole building, you end up with a, with a setup that takes one square meter of your optical table and one, one rack maybe. And um, uh, now, uh, if you remember at the be beginning, I said that we will explain all of the, the parts that, uh, that are needed to construct the optical clock. So we have, we spoke about a frequency comb that is used as a counter for the, for the terahertz frequencies for the optical transitions. We said that you reference it to the atoms, either single ions or, or uh, neutral atoms in the lattice. And for your local oscillator, you use ultra stable laser, which is, which is what uh, our uh, group Maurice's and mine uh, deals with. So uh, basically as a, as a joke uh, uh, in, the, in the time and frequency community, laser continuous operation, uh, continuous laser can be observed as a, well, just band past noise. So um, you need to apply certain techniques you, uh, in order to make a, uh, laser that you can buy that has some line width of few of few hundred uh, or uh, hertz or kilohertz or megahertz, uh, the more silent the better out of the box. You need to apply some some techniques, and uh, you uh, reference this laser to a to a to a reference cavity, and as the output uh, you get ultra stable lasers. With a, free, uh, with a line width of, of, of the order of one hertz, but that will all be shown. And this ultra stable laser then can be used as a local oscillator for your optical clock. So <clears throat> I will speak about uh, more tech, uh, not too much technically, but just, just a few ideas about the uh, pound over hole technique of laser stabilization to a rigid reference cavity. So in order to stabilize the laser, when, when I said the out of the box laser has certain line width, you need some stable reference, either atoms, um, or you can use a macroscopic filter, which is a Fabri-Perot uh, resonator, which we will see in the next slide, because you need to know where you're, you need somehow to, 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 to convert the fluctuations of your laser frequencies uh, to voltage, to usable signal, uh, which, is, which is here. So you, you need to discriminate your fluctuations of your laser frequencies and to see how much volts you can extract for, for a certain, each uh, hertz of your laser fluctuation. Then you process that signal you apply a uh, amplifier uh, through the loop filter, which amplifies these volts that you extract from your frequency discriminator. And then with a, a correction signal, uh, you, act, you act on a laser actuator, being a piezo temperature uh, of, the, of the laser chip, and you, you steer your laser frequency. And uh, at the end, you end up with the frequency of your laser being equal to the frequency of the reference that you used to stabilize it. So uh, probably it's not, uh, yeah, it, uh, it's uh, not so easy to stabilize a laser to the atoms directly. So in order to make a clock, first you, first you need to kind of pre-stabilize the laser to, uh, rigid uh, reference cavity. So it's just a chunk of super stable glass. So we use, uh, actually my, uh, my image here is quite blurry, uh, but um, uh, you use a piece of a very 
special glass that is called ULE glass. And uh, by contacting two super reflective mirrors to, to this uh, spacer, uh, you can construct a reference cavity which resonates at certain frequencies. And uh, these, uh, these resonances you use as, um, as a reference for your laser stabilization. Um, some important stuff about the, the reference cavity is a free, free spectral range determined completely by the length of the cavity. So if you have a cavity of, let's say, five centimeters, you have a free spectral range uh, of three gigahertz, which means that every three gigahertz, you have a reference frequency to stabilize the laser. Uh, I have to hurry up a little bit. So um, one important thing that everybody sees about the ultra stable laser and the reference cavities that are used to stabilize them is the finesse and it's simple the relationship between the the width of the resonance of the cavity to to the free spectral range of the cavity and the uh, finesse is basically defined strictly and only by the reflectivity of the mirrors therefore we have to use the mirrors that have the losses of the few parts per million in order to reach the super high finesses that are needed for nice laser stabilization. And here is an example of something that is, uh, that is kind of routine for us, 12 centimeter cavity with a 250,000 finesse. And uh, you end up with a, with a resonance line width of, of five kilohertz uh, order in that case. But why you need, uh, why you need such a sharp resonances is because you want basically to, to steer the, resonance, uh, the, the, the cavity of the laser that you are stabilizing to the cavity, to the super rigid stabilized cavity and uh, uh, the physics and uh, the techniques how to deal with the, how to prepare a reference cavity for laser stabilization is the subject of our next webinar. Uh, so in one week on the 27th. So everything about uh, the fluctuation of the reference cavity and how you actually make this system, a lot of engineering is going to be subject of the next uh, webinar. So basically you want to, uh, you want to phase lock the, the cavity of your laser to the, to the reference cavity. And in order to do that, you apply um, pound rubble uh, hole technique, which is basically uh, shining uh, uh, three uh, frequency component light, component light to your cavity. And then in the reflection, when the cavity is resonant, uh, with the, uh, when the laser is resonant with the cavity, you have a, a carrier that is being transmitted through the cavity and you have two side bands that are that are completely reflected from the cavity because in frequency domain your your transmission is very narrow as as i gave you an example five kilohertz in our case so everything in the frequency domain that is far away from the carrier is fully reflected from the first mirror of the cavity and then uh, you you have uh, somehow a counter counteracting two beats from a lower side band and the upper side band making a beat with the leakage of the carrier from the cavity because of course the cavity has some parts per million leakage and these interaction of these two beats is giving you a characteristic a pound rover hole signal uh, that we will uh, show you uh, during the next webinar in a pre-recorded live demonstration and uh, uh, what is important about this uh, uh, technique of the laser stabilization, your laser knows exactly on which side uh, of the resonance of the reference cavity it is either below or high. So the stabilization loop can act accordingly and lock the laser to the cavity. And uh, uh, this is the illustration of why you are always interested in high finesse cavity because this uh, uh, cavity line width contributes to the sensitivity of your of your to your frequency discriminator. How many volts again you will get per uh, per deviation of of your laser frequency? So the the lower the lower the 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 line width of your reference cavity, the higher the discriminator, and the the the, the better the stabilization loop of the laser is.
So um, uh, in order to, to see how good the, the, the reference cavity is, we, you usually take a finesse measurement, which comprises of locking the laser to the reference cavity and then abruptly inter interrupting the, the lock and the measuring the decay time of the energy in the cavity. And when it falls down to one over E, this is the characteristic decay time and which directly gives you the, the line width of the reference cavity and uh, you can calculate the finesses from it. So again, one of our results is like a 300,000 order of magnitude finesse. So that was about the reference cavity. And now the, 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 uh, the final part is the performance of the uh, ultra stable lasers uh, used as a local oscillator for the, for the optical clocks. This is, the, <clears throat> this is how the noise of your laser, we spoke about the noise in the beginning. In this case, this is the frequency noise, uh, looks like before and after the stabilization. And uh, if you have the, the, the frequency noise of your laser at disposal, if measured, you can use it to, to, to uh, extract the line width, to, to calculate the line width, but you have to be aware that in this process of extraction of the line width, you have, to, uh, you have a two-step numerical integration where you have to introduce the limits uh, of integration in your frequency noise spectrum. And uh, this basically means that your line width depends on the on the time. So when you speak about the ultra narrow line width, it is correct to state the sampling time that you have used to characterize your line width. So in our case, when we put the data in our data sheets, we, we always sample our line width with, uh, in this case, the decided by the technical uh, reasons, we sample it at the order of three seconds, which means that this, laser that we that we uh, produce for you is really an ultra stable laser that has the uh, uh, terahertz carrier stable at the level of, of uh, one hertz in some seconds and it's not uh, 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 um, one hertz line width at the, at the order of milliseconds or something so this is important to state that the line width uh, that one hertz line width is at the, at the level of some seconds uh, visible, and this is one, this is one of our characteristic uh, <clears throat> characteristic stability curves. So we routinely reach stabilities at ten to the minus fifteen if we use uh, super crystalline mirrors and all of the options that we will speak about the next in the next webinar. We can go to the mid of ten to the minus sixteen. So our range of operations is five to the ten to the minus sixteen up to 5 to the 10 to the minus 15, and we can deliver uh, routinely stuff in, in that, this range. So this is uh, an illustration for you now that you have been educated how to interpret the stability curves. You can see the drift in the stabilized laser. You can see the laser phase noise. And uh, uh, if you are more interested, then uh, you will be seeing more of these graphs, and you will start to recognize the behavior of your oscillators from the stability graphs. And uh, here we have comparison of some, some uh, high-end oscillators. And again, uh, we are in the business of ULE stabilized lasers. So this is kind of one of the representative, uh, representative curves of the behavior of the stable laser. But since we also produce super clean microwave, by extracting the, the stability that we reach in the, in the ultra stable laser through the frequency comb, our uh, photonic microwave generation systems can reach uh, the levels of stability that are below all of the known uh, and the market present uh, local uh, commercially available uh, oscillators and that therefore we are capable of delivering a complete system for the for the optical clock uh, 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 building uh, support yeah and uh, so you, you are invited to take a look at, at our PMWG uh, product specs as well and uh, finally uh, um, you think okay I have a nice oscillator I'm going to make an optical clock but um, of course the problems are only beginning because in the macroscopic domain you have macro problems and in the atomic domain 
you have uh, atomic problems. So here are just listed without going in details, but just to give you an information that again, uh, uh, to, to manipulate the atoms, it, it also takes a lot of skill. But finally, when, you, when, the, when the performance are, are, when you engineer nicely the, the handling of your atoms, you expect what I mentioned to end up with the atomic quality factors of 10 to the 14th and higher. And you, you expect to, to end up with the, with the super performance of the, of the optical clocks. And uh, here we see how it is combined, the performance of the local oscillator with a long-term reference uh, from the atoms. You usually, I don't know if I said, you usually use uh, atoms for the long-term stability of the optical clocks and you rely on the performance of the local oscillator from the laser in the short term. And uh, here is basically the, the evolution of the performance of the cesium-based uh, standards and the optical, optical clocks. And uh, you see that uh, the, the situation is uh, getting close to, to the re redefinition of the second. So at some point in future, the second will be redefined because you have seen that now nowadays the, the optical clocks are reaching the performances at, at, the, at the level of 10 to the minus 18. And I, I invite you also to, to uh, uh, take a look at our very nicely produced uh, a video that is, that is uh, partially uh, uh, recorded in PTV. Uh, uh, German uh, German Institute for uh, for uh, primary uh, national metrology laboratory where we have contributed to one of the of the optical clocks with with our lasers and uh, this video is quite informative and uses very nice language to explain you what an optical clock is and uh, probably it's a continuation of this of this talk. So here is a list of the references that I used. And if you are more interested in, in, in knowing more, you can take a look. You will get the list of these references with the file that we will share now in, in chat uh, and you can download. And uh, this is uh, basically, this concludes my, my talk. So I guided you through a little bit of history. I explained you how to characterize the oscillators. I, uh, we, we talked about why we are motivated to build optical clocks, how we technically do it and what we can, what we can contribute to the, uh, with our ultra stable lasers to, to the performances of the, of the, of the optical clocks. Okay, so uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. And again, uh, thank to OIDA for, for uh, hosting this webinar. And I, I hope to see you the next week uh, where we will speak uh, more about techniques uh, and the physics of the laser reference cavity. And basically you will learn all of the options and uh, all the tricks that you need uh, to stabilize the laser, how, how they are technically realized and you will see them live in, in uh, some of our systems. So again, thank you for your attention and please, uh, uh, we would like to have a few questions if the time allows us. I think um, Nicola, Maurice and Dag have been doing a really great job and answered a lot of questions that have come in throughout the webinar. Um, but thank you for your time today. Um, this was a great presentation and for Patricia for hosting and Maurice and Dag for being so great with the Q&A. Um, for all the attendees, just a reminder, we are recording today's webinar. So I did send a link in the chat box where you can find the recording um, in the next one to two business days. If you have any questions for the Menlo team, the sales at menlosystems.com um, email is on the screen. Feel free to send them a note. If there are any questions that didn't get to today that you would like them to answer, that's a great opportunity to do that. We've sent several chat boxes um, or messages in the chat box, resources for additional material, the survey, um, links that uh, Nicola was referencing in the presentation. And I also sent the uh, URL to register for next week's uh, part two of this webinar. So all of this information is in the chat box. Um, you can also send a note to the email address on the screen or to oida at osa.org. I'd be happy to share any of this information again with you. So appreciate all of you attending and your time today. And um, thank you again to Menlo for sponsoring today's webinar. And I hope to see you all ne again next week. Take care.